Good afternoon. Uh, this is David Abrahams, uh, Head of Legal at the ISM. Welcome to this webinar, uh, Top Tips for Performers. Um, and I'm delighted that you've been able to join us this afternoon. Uh, I'm co-presenting the webinar this afternoon with uh, Joel Garthwaite of Bright Ivy Artist Management Limited. Uh, we had hoped that Joel would be joining me uh, in the ISM offices uh, today, so we'd be able to, to share the webinar. Uh, he's had some transport difficulties, uh, but through the wonders of modern technology, we're hoping uh, that he will be able to join us remotely, uh, and he's just, uh, we're hoping, lo logging on at the moment. So, um, Hello. Ah, is that Joel? Hi. I'm here, I'm here. <laughs> Great. Well, I'm delighted you now have two presenters as advertised for this uh, webinar, Top Tips for Performers. Uh, as I say, very pleased that Joel was, uh, has been able to join us. Um, just a few preliminary matters before we get into the meat of the webinar. Um, you can hear us, both myself and Joel, uh, but you can't speak to us. That's not, not the way these things work. Um, what we're planning to do, we've got an hour, uh, we've got a presentation with about 30 to 40 minutes worth of uh, material that we'd like to present to you. Uh, and then um, we will um, want to allow plenty of time for questions. And the way you ask questions is by typing questions into the question box that you should be able to see uh, on your screen. Uh, so uh, hopefully that will be very straightforward. We'll, we look forward to taking lots of questions from you in due course. Uh, if you've got any technical uh, difficulties, you can um, also uh, uh, um, communicate with our technical support team uh, using the um, uh, chat box as well. So if you are having any technical issues, uh, then you can uh, communicate through that. Um, and I think we're then ready to start. Um, we've got four topics that we're going to cover uh, this afternoon. Uh, the first topic one is getting booked for gigs and live performances. Uh, and Joel will be ta taking us through some, some 10 top tips for, uh, for gigs and live performances. The second topic is getting booked for recording sessions. Uh, the third topic is introducing the ISM template performance contract. And the fourth topic is making sure you get your performer royalties from PPL. All four of those topics are covered in the new ISM performer pack uh, that we're launching today to coincide with this webinar. Uh, so um, from uh, now, I think you'll be able to uh, download the performer pack from the ISM website. Uh, that's freely available to everybody, whether you're an ISM member or not. So if you're interested in the topics we're talking about today, do have a look at the ISM performer pack. It covers these issues and, and, and in, in rather more detail, perhaps, than we're going to be able to do in today's introductory webinar. Uh, but um, uh, we will now move on to the first of those topics, which is getting booked for gigs and live performances. We've got 10 top tips on that subject for you. And Joel, this is the point where I'm going to hand over to you uh, to talk about those 10 top tips. OK, well, hopefully you can hear me. Um, I'm currently sitting <laughs> in an emergency pub in uh, Baldock, um, having not been able to move on the train for the last minute two hours. So can you hear me OK, David? Uh, yeah, we're, I'm hearing you loud right. and clear, so I'm just thinking okay, while good. activities can. OK, so um, nice to be here. Sorry I can't be with David in person, but hopefully this is the second best thing. Um, if um, it's a little bit loud, then I am in a public space, so please bear with me. Um, OK, so looking at some tips which I wrote for the, um, the, the new information pack which David was just talking about. Um, I came up with 10 tips which hopefully will steer you in the right direction uh, if you're looking to get some more live performances and gigs 
when, I'm, when we talk about live performances, gigs, concerts, they're all the same thing. Um, obviously, my background is in contemporary classical music, but they can be applied to any genre of music um, as well. So, number one, um, get a website. It sounds pretty simple, really. Um, you know, building and designing a website doesn't have to be expensive um, nowadays, and if you're technically minded, um, then you can do this yourself. There are website platforms available like Weebly and WordPress, um, which a lot of people are using, and it costs very little to, to, to run a website that way. Um, but I always advise people to seek advice from an industry professional who knows what promoters are looking from um, web musicians' websites, because it's not only the information which you think might be important for people, it's important to think of it from a promoter's perspective and what they are actually looking for from a website um, as well. It might not always be the same thing. Um, if you don't want to design the website yourself, then um, you can set aside a relatively small amount of money as an investment um, and probably 500 pounds um, worth of um, web design work will see you right for a very simple website. It's very important nowadays that websites are optimized for mobile devices. Um, about 50% of people actually view websites only on mobiles and don't even open them on a desktop. So having to pinch the screen and text appearing very, very small can be frustrating for viewers. So optimizing those um, sites is important. Um, it's absolutely essential to have a, a good online presence when we're trying to secure work in an extremely crowded marketplace. Um, a lot of people are doing the same thing as you and I are doing, so making sure we have the right amount of information and it easily accessible for people it can't be underestimated. Um, the website needs to be at least clearly um, presented and outline what work you do. Um, increasingly needs to include what we call media, so audio and video. People um, have much shorter attention spans than they used to um, and video is a very common way that people consume information these days. So having videos, good quality videos, um, will also um, bode well. Um, it'll give promoters, festivals and agents the information that they need as well um, to kind of make decisions on booking you as an artist. Um, it's kind of very difficult to sell yourself just with words these days. So making sure that you actually have proof whether it's audio and um, video um, is really useful. Um, all, it sounds really simple, but make sure that you're displaying your contact details clearly as well um, so people can actually get in touch with you if they want to book you for um, these things. In the performance pack, which David mentioned, um, there's a couple of companies listed on there who are doing exclusive discounts for ISM members. So if you were interested in website work, then um, you can check those out. Um, the second point um, on the list, uh, kind of linked to um, online type things, is um, social media as a tool for promotion. Um, I think it shouldn't be underestimated how many promoters actually go to social media as their first port of call to find out information about artists or ensembles. Um, generally they do this because it contains the most up-to-date version or up-to-date details of um, what a performer has been up to and is doing. So if, if you're kind of dipping in and out of your social media accounts and not updating them as often as you'd like, then have a think about this because um, the last thing you want to do is come across as inactive because obviously um, it doesn't look great for promoters. Um, every tweet or Facebook status you do doesn't have to be riveting and absolute gold, but um, just kind of letting people know that you are around and still doing what you say you're doing is really useful. Um, Twitter provides you with a great opportunity to communicate with an audience globally um, and make some really valuable contacts. Um, it's really easy to reach out to promoters and festivals using Twitter. Um, it provides you with a direct link to within the industry without having to go to the hassle of making sure you've got the right email addresses for people. Um, it's brilliant for that type of thing. Um, and people often talk about followers, how many followers you have on Twitter. Um, and people don't really realize that to develop a following, you need to interact with other people, um, reaching out and engaging with people, um, commenting on statuses that they are writing, um, and kind of actually forming a relationship with them as if you would do in person, but through Twitter. Just kind of simply writing tweets about what you've been up to that day doesn't really help develop your following. Um, 
and it's a very personal way of running an account that way rather than actually trying to use it for promotional uh, methods. And, and Facebook and Twitter are not kind of linked uh, in the way people think they're linked as well. Facebook is um, a major platform to advertise your work. Um, business pages and marketing tools for advertising are readily available on Facebook and they're quite powerful. But linking it to Twitter so it can you, your tweets and your Facebook statuses are the same is actually um, it can prove damaging because the reason that people use Twitter or use Facebook exclusively is because they don't like the other platform and they don't like the way it's presented so um, if you're speaking in Twitter speak and it's appearing in your Facebook then it's going to put some audiences off um, so do resist the temptation to link your accounts so the same information is automatically posted to both um, it's not going to help you out in too many ways. Um, okay, so I think um, moving on to the next slide. Um, knowing your music and its marketplace. So surprisingly, a lot of musicians, because they are very, very creative and they like to do lots of different things, um, they, they fail to streamline what they do and make it an easy decision for promoters to book them for it. Um, so when I think one of the main reasons promoters often turn down pitches um, is that it doesn't actually target that specific um, festival demographic closely enough. So I've come up with a few things that you should do. Um, all of these are listed in the performers pack, but um, just to go through them to make sure you consider um, these things for every opportunity you're looking into. Um, so first of all, making sure that the genre of the program closely matches the festival or the venue or the concert series you're pitching it to. Um, there's no point in pitching um, a concert of string quartet of Mozart and Brahms and Bach and Beethoven to um, a festival that exclusively does jazz. It's just a waste of everyone's time. Um, if you're a classical performer um, in particular, make sure the pieces that you're actually pitching haven't been performed at the festival in the last couple of seasons. And while some festivals will accept kind of repeat performances, um, most like to keep it fairly varied. If the proposal is quite niche, um, it's probably best to speak with the festival before submitting it formally if they do accept formal proposals, um, just to make sure that, for example, if you're um, one of the more what you call risky ensembles for a festival, such as the saxophone quartet, they're not quite sure how much, um, how many audience members they're going to get for a concert of that nature. Definitely speak to them first before investing loads of time into submitting a proposal, because they might just turn it down on the fact that um, it's too niche for their audience demographic. Um, Making sure you're getting hold of the right person. It sounds really simple, but festival management and directorship can change quite frequently. So always check you have the latest contact details to hand. If you already have a busy diary or you need some help, um, you can consider approaching some agencies or management companies to contact festivals on your behalf. Um, I obviously run an artist management agency and we do this type of work for the artists that we represent um, and it's not always as simple as kind of reaching out to one of these agencies and asking them to do it because obviously they have to make sure their brand um, alignment is good as well and they're only representing the people that they think they can actually help and get concerts for so it's not quite as easy as securing one like that um, but if you do manage to, to, to kind of work with an artist management company or an agency, that they have really good information about festivals, programmings um, into the future, which isn't available to the public normally. Um, for example, you know the South Bank Centre and King's Place, and a lot of the BBC orchestras plan their series many, many years in advance. And whilst these are not always um, common knowledge to the public, a lot of the management companies do have this information, so it does help with pitching programmes. Um, and the last thing on that list is working with the festival to create your program um, to a particular theme. Um, so each year certain festivals very specifically for um, specifically follow a theme. Um, City of London Festival quite often have a theme, for example. Um, so making sure that the proposal you're pitching to them actually fits within that theme and speaking to them directly about that, otherwise you would never know. Um, Number four was uh, creating content that people want to share. So this comes back to the idea of um, consumption of information is very much now audio and video. Um, and musicians are brilliant at coming up with ideas and programs. But 
what musicians need to do is have a plan to get these more widely seen and heard. Um, otherwise, they may not get the recognition they should do. So making sure you have high quality video and audio, audio are the best examples of how to showcase your work online. Um, good quality recording equipment is now pretty affordable. So think of it as an investment in the same way as you're thinking of your website as an investment. Um, and sharing things via social media um, will bring you the widest reach in today's world. Um, the type of content that you create on that is really important as it forms your whole image and it forms your ideas into, a, into one place that people can easily see you. Um, a full length video of a concert from kind of one camera at the back of the room isn't engaging content. Um, you know, you need to think of it as a trailer for the work that you do, um, documentary style trailers with little clips, performer interviews, behind the scenes footage, that type of thing. That will keep the viewer's attention for much longer um, and it generally explains projects in a more rounded way rather than just simply being a whole length. People are very unlikely to, to, to watch all the way through. Um, press releases to mainstream print and online publications still do have um, their place and should be sent when there's a large scale project being announced. But to be honest, uh, blogs and YouTube and Vimeo are where most people will learn about your work. Um, so it's, I'd say, more important to make sure that the presence on those channels um, is as good as it could be. If you can build a strong following on YouTube and other social media channels, then um, generally you become a more viable proposition to promoters because they'll um, see that you already have a following. Um, and with that following, obviously, it's a, a less risky proposition for them because they know that people will come to the concert. Um, okay, so number five, network and developing relationships. Um, so with music in particular, it's a very small world. Whilst being a very crowded marketplace, it's also quite small. Everyone kind of knows each other. So the ability to network effectively and build on relationships is essential for musicians. Um, for those of you who have um, heard talks I've done in the past or webinars I've done in the past, I, I talk a lot about networking and developing relationships. Um, and it's still really, really important. Um, musicians are obviously people who like to see results very quickly. Um, they tend to be quite impatient. Um, but you should resist the temptation to kind of ask people outright for things, in my opinion. You know, you need to approach them with a, a view to having a conversation about things, um, not necessarily having an angle, but, you know, build that relationship um, on trust and resist that temptation to kind of get something from every conversation you have and go into um, every conversation with an angle of getting something from it. It doesn't always uh, work that way. Um, you know, building those relationships is the key to getting asked back for repeat performances as well. Um, so when you, if you do actually secure a concert or an engagement as a result of some networking you've done, you're, you turn up to the work prepared and uh, well presented and punctual and, you know, you're giving the promoter confidence that um, you, you, you're, you're showing your value as a professional musician. Um, honing your communication skills. Uh, I think the way that you communicate with bookers is really important and knowing how certain bookers like to communicate is the key to establishing uh, contact first um, and also actually receiving feedback. So most bookers communicate via email because it's so quick and um, leaves a trail of correspondence that they can refer back to um, in the future. Um, a lot of people will say we'll keep the proposals on, on file and basically that means it'll lurk around in their inbox for some, for some time. Um, but certain promoters, especially some of the music societies and music clubs across the UK, um, they, they, they definitely prefer to speak on the phone. So identifying you know, how specific promoters look to engage with artists is important because um, you, know, you need to make them feel comfortable. Um, so if they don't like emailing because it takes them a long time because they never learned to type, for example, then definitely we need to bow to the way they prefer to communicate. Um, and making sure the tone of your communication is, is kind of really important. Um, 
you need to adapt it depending on who you're speaking to. So if someone is very formal and they're using terms sir and madam and um, signing off yours sincerely, obviously a reply saying, hey mate, how's it going, isn't probably going to go down too well. Um, so you need to adapt your, your conversation style um, depending on who you're speaking to. Um, you know, it's kind of psychologically the right thing to do as well. Um, similar minded people are more likely to kind of uh, help each other out, it's been proven. Okay, so um, the next step, um, setting the right price. Uh, we, we often talk about kind of musicians being undervalued and that's still the case, but you know, we are sometimes uh, responsible for that ourselves and we do make a rod for our own back. You know, the, the, the principle is that as a professional musician you should be paid a fair price for the work that you do. Um, you know, there's that analogy going around on Facebook and Twitter at the moment about um, people arguing over the cost of a seven piece band to do um, a function and the, the, the organizer saying, God, how, how on earth does it cost that much for music? That's completely crazy. And um, you know, them replying saying, well, if you call out seven plumbers on a Friday night and ask them to work for six hours without any food in, in overtime, you know, see how much they'll charge you and uh, we'll go out for half. So, so um, you know, I think we, we do need to set ourselves a fair price and remember that we, we have trained very very well in what we do and we shouldn't undervalue it. But at the same time, uh, we need to make sure that we're charging the market value. Um, and establishing what that market value is is, is pretty um, important and there's a couple of ways that we can look at doing that. Uh, I think the first thing to note is that the market value is obviously only what people are prepared to pay for something um, and if people are prepared to pay an extortion amount for something then you know we should look to get that amount and um, if they're not then we need to have a conversation to see whether that actually is um, going to be a viable proposition for us. But um, basically I have three tactics when, when setting prices um, and they're very simple. The first is to be cheaper than your competitors. Um, uh, the, the middle ground is to match a competitor's price and the third is obviously to price higher than competitors and obviously each of those has pros and its cons. So being cheaper than competitors, you, you, you can entice people, but you know if you're considered less uh, good as a result of undercutting other musicians or um, agreeing to pay for free, then that's damaging to, 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 to kind of the profession as a whole, and um, we don't advocate doing that at all. Um, but certainly, you know, offering a, a slight discount on what someone else has offered um, to do a, a a concert for might initially get you the contact, but this step certainly shouldn't be uh, the hard and fast rule for doing business. You need to work out what your profit margin needs to be and then work it out based on that. Um, matching a competitor's price is, is easy to do if you can actually find out what other people are charging. Um, obviously you can't pluck a figure out of thin air, but um, if you ask a few colleagues, I'm sure they'd be delighted to kind of have those conversations with you because it's um, of use for the whole industry. Um, I think some transparency over what going rates are for people will, will do us all a lot of favours and hopefully help us undercutting our colleagues. Um, and the second thing, the, the, the last thing to do about pricing higher than competitors is, is obviously a risky tactic because um, you know you can outprice yourself very quickly but certain people for some reason they still think it is a, a stamp of quality somehow um, and you, you can try it. Um, if you're pricing high though um, uh, personally, I feel that it's, it's a very uncomfortable thing to do to know that um, you're deliberately inflating the price of something. Um, but if you are going to do that, then you need to make sure that what you're offering is a, a premium product um, and everything that goes with it is uh, a premium product as well. So an up-to-date website, high-quality audio, video, um, it's absolutely essential. Um, the most powerful way of getting people to book you is to get them to actually see what you're doing, so inviting them to, to see your work. Um, there is, uh, having run the artist agency for um, a couple of years now, the, the, the most success that we see in uh, promoters booking our artists is if we can get them along to a concert they're doing. There's no substitute for that because it's the only way, no matter how good the video and the audio and the website is and all of that business, it's it's the only way which they can engage directly with the artist, get to see what they're doing live and, and kind of almost imagine it happening in their own festival. So definitely inviting people along to things, um, the, the number one way of marketing yourself. 
Um, number nine, being proactive. Musicians generally are very proactive people. They, they want things to happen very quickly, like I said before. But um, you need to think a bit like an agent um, in, in your way of thinking and actually um, you know, think that agents make a living out of basically getting promoters, festival broadcasters, other musicians to, to, to know what their artists are doing. They're kind of a marketing tool. Um, and if you don't um, have the access to an agent or a management company, you need to be doing this work yourself. Um, if it becomes too much, then look into some administration. Uh, there's lots of good freelance administrators who do that type of work. It doesn't necessarily have to be an artist management company or an agency. It can be um, a freelance uh, uh, administrator. Um, if you've got a concert idea or a CD that you want to publicize, then um, some PR can sometimes be um, a good idea as well. Uh, some PR companies within the music industry are excellent and some are pretty terrible. Um, I've worked with a combination of the two. Um, and it's for that reason that we've actually just started doing our own PR and um, working with um, a PR team that we recommend because I've just had so many bad bad cases come to us from PR companies that just haven't done the work that they should have. So do beware there. Um, but the one thing to remember is the PR companies are only as good as the information that they're working with. So the stories that they're trying to tell. Um, it's pretty blunt, but the, the analogy I always use is woman releases violin album is a pretty terrible story. And um, not many people would want to write articles in the Times or the Guardian about that type of thing. So um, making sure that there is a story behind everything and thinking from a publicist's point of view how to how they can promote things is very important. Um, and the last point, um, using critical feedback to your advantage. Um, you know, you, you will get criticisms and if you're promoting yourself to a lot of different people, then you could be prepared to accept that not everyone is going to want to, to book you for things. But um, you know, be positive with the feedback you get. And obviously, if it's kind of overly critical and nasty, that's a different thing. But um, generally, take it on board and um, try not to reply too quickly. Let it sink in and absorb it so you don't actually act on impulse. <laughs> um, so always try try to, to get um, as much information as you can as to why a proposal that you've sent to a festival or promoter hasn't worked. So if they just don't reply or send a, a blank no back to you, then just push a little bit to kind of get um, some clarity as to why, because um, that will be important for you going forward and obviously helps your own personal development, professional development as well. Um, Needless to say, don't kind of uh, take an aggressive approach with anyone if they come back and say they don't want you. It's not a personal thing normally. <laughs> uh, it's to do with just it's not a good fit for them. Um, and the last thing is kind of uh, while staying true to your beliefs is hugely important to your own artistic integrity. Um, if many people give you the same feedback and you're getting the same feedback from lots of different people, then perhaps the proposal needs a little bit more thought or adjustment to make it a viable proposition for the people that you're approaching. Um, there's no shame in having to diversify or having to rethink something. It's just part of the process. Um, so again, don't take it personally and um, do act on that feedback. So hopefully um, all of those points are kind of further elaborated on in the uh, information pack, the performance pack. Um, and I think, David, I can hand back to you to cover the next section. That's right. Thanks, Joel, for those very helpful uh, tips on uh, uh, gig gigs and live performances. Uh, as you say, I'm now going to move on to the second session of the webinar, which is uh, some tips on getting booked for recording sessions. Uh, and again, we've got sort of 10 themes that we've drawn out in the performer guide based on discussions with uh, uh, people in the industry who've got a lot of, ex of experience uh, dealing with recording sessions. So I'll just quickly take you through those. First of all, and, and I make no apology for the fact that some of this overlaps with what Joel has been saying. It's the, in, some, in some ways, it's very similar skills uh, that, that musicians need in all areas of their work. So the first of all, networking. Um, uh, knowing people who are already doing session work can be really helpful. Uh, if they know you, if they know the kind of work you do, they know how good a musician you are, how reliable you are, 
then you're going to get recommendations from them, uh, hopefully, uh, and that can get you into, um, uh, into doing this recording session work. So back to what Joel was saying about networking, the more people you know, the more people you have positive relationships with within the industry, the better it is for you. So that net, those networking skills are just so important. Secondly, sight reading skills. Um, this may seem obvious, uh, but, but it's worth saying if you're doing recording session work, you will be expected to get to grips with the music very, very quickly. Uh, if you think there's going to be something particularly tricky that you've not had a chance to look at before, try and arrive 15, 20 minutes early to, to have a look at the music before the session begins. But sight reading skills, absolutely essential. Uh, third point, uh, again, this goes back to networking. Most session work comes through fixers or established session contractors. So you need to be building uh, uh, contacts, relationships with the fixers and the session contractors who organize this type of work. So who you know uh, is part of the business that we are in and, and, and you, you need to understand that. Um, fourth is a point about playing style. Play in a style that's appropriate to the, the piece you are recording. There isn't a special uh, uh, re re recording style. Um, play as a sensitive musician would uh, in a performance of that particular piece uh, and that should uh, meet the requirements of the, of the recording session. Moving on to point five, don't play for free. Um, again, this, this is something Joel touched on. Uh, music is a profession, not a hobby. Uh, don't be exploited. Uh, uh, don't um, uh, um, feel that, that because you're starting out in the industry, you, 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 you have to um, say yes to, to any request that comes in. Uh, you are a professional and you've worked very hard for your professional qualifications and you ought to be paid for what you do. Um, point six then is negotiating a fair fee. Well, this is something where you may well want to take uh, advice. If you're an ISM member, you can come to us for fees advice. Very, very broadly speaking, £120 uh, for a three-hour session is, is a, a sort of standard rate. That, that's the standard rate that's paid under the BPIMU agreement that's quite often used for, for recording sessions. But there are lots and lots of variations and variables that you, you need to take into account. Um, you should definitely be paid more for TV or radio work. We have an ISM BBC agreement that sets uh, higher rates that you might want to refer to. Um, but if in doubt, take advice. Um, obviously, it's really important that you're being paid a fair fee for what you do. Point seven, always make sure that there's a written contract in place. Um, that will come, cover a number of issues, but uh, perhaps most importantly, confirming how much you're actually going to get pay, paid for the session. Uh, so that's really important. Ideally, that should be a formal contract, even if it's quite short. Um, but uh, uh, if you can't get that, even an exchange of emails confirming your fee is better than having nothing at all because it gives you some kind of paper trail for what the deal was uh, before you actually go into the recording studio. Um, uh, point eight, insist on a writing credit for any music you create, including improvisations. Again, that's about being assertive in an appropriate professional way. Uh, if you have made a creative contribution to the recording, you should expect to get a writing credit. Point nine, be professional. Uh, do the best job you can, maintain a positive and helpful attitude. No one can guarantee that you're going to be asked back to do more sessions. Um, uh, uh, there may be all, all kinds of factors uh, in play, but the, the best way of ensuring that you will be asked back is to do a great job, do a professional job, be positive, be friendly, be helpful, be flexible. Um, but um, at the same time, don't allow yourself to be exploited. That is the, the balance that professional musicians need to uh, find. We at the ISM will, will, will try and help you find that right balance, uh, and there are other people who can support you in that, but that's what you need to be aiming for. And point 10, develop your skills. Improvising skills is a good example of that, but there may be other specialised skills that you can develop which could lead to interesting collaborations. Um, I've said sight reading is really important, 
but we you shouldn't think that, that that's all there is to um, session work and recording sessions there are other specialized skills that you might be able to bring to bear that that could help you um, with your um, uh, in developing um, uh, session recording session work um, Joel is there anything you want to add to those 10 points no I I, I think that's um pretty much covered things. I, I think uh, they, they go into slightly a little bit of extra detail in the performance pack, so um, uh, I think Rob Ames from the London Contemporary Orchestra helped me out with um, those sections in the pack. Um, so obviously he, he's used to dealing with these things uh, very often. Um, so definitely all of those points worth considering and um, reading up further on in the performance pack. Right, thanks Joel. Um, We've also got a section in the performance pact on, on getting an agent or a manager uh, and the point there is you should um, approach agents and managers with a clear outline of your plans for the next two years and those plans should focus not only on the, on the artistic aspect which I know many musicians they, they will tend to do the uh, think about the artistic aspects first for obvious reasons you also need to be thinking about financial viability, how you're going to make money, because uh, basically agent, if you're not a financially viable proposition, agents and managers are not going to be interested in you. Um, secondly, you should make sure that you're contacting agents who are a good match for the genre of music you work within. Obviously, there are loads and loads of different agents and managers out there, so do try and you know, um, concentrate your resources, concentrate your time and your energy on the agents and managers who are going to be the best match for the kind of music that you do. Uh, and the third piece of advice is, is don't give up. There are thousands of, of agents and managers out there to contact. Uh, you can find their details on the uh, IAMA uh, website, International Ar Artist Management, Management Association website. Um, so uh, don't give up, it, it can be tough out there, but if you keep plugging away, hopefully uh, you will um, uh, get someone who um, you, you can work with and, and help you with your career. Uh, another thing that I just want to mention at this point, and again I touched it on it under the, the sort of recording session advice, is think about your responsibilities as a performer. That's technical preparation, obviously, but it's also being prepared to talk about the music you perform. Uh, that's something that promoters and festival organisers uh, often really want. That, that, that they want performers who can talk with enthusiasm and passion about the music they're performing, whether that's contemporary music um, uh, um, or where, you, know, you, you may know the composer, you may work in close collaboration with the composer, but it could be something from the, the classical repertoire. You need to be able to talk about what it is uh, that um, uh, really inspires you and fires you about the music you're performing. So that's really important. Then and that, again, some more, some perhaps obvious points about dress, punctuality and behavior. You've got to um, uh, always maintain the highest standards uh, in relation to, 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 to those aspects. That is, um, uh, again, part and parcel of being a professional uh, and having a career as a professional uh, musician. Uh, flexibility, I've already talked about a friendly, flexible um, uh, and um, uh, sort of adaptable approach uh, uh, creates a good impression and can be really helpful. Finally, something we're really keen on uh, here is copyright issues. Uh, ISM members are, include composers as well. Um, you, may, you may compose, uh, your friends may be composers. Um, make sure that you've thought about the copyright issues. Uh, if um, uh, the composer is a member of the PRS, it's essential that the venue has a PRS license in place. Uh, if uh, the composer isn't a member of the PRS, if they, they manage their own copyright, then make sure you've got their permission before you perform their work. Moving on, um, I just want to say a bit about the ISM's template performance contract. You'll find this in the performer guide that Joel and I have been talking about. It's on the website today. Uh, we've got a revised version of our performance contract. Uh, and uh, using a written contract, we think, is a really important part of uh, being a, a professional musician, a really good idea. Uh, and I'll just take you through some of the key aspects of that contract. 
Why we think it's a good idea, one, because it provides clarity for the performer and the promoter right from the start, perhaps many, many weeks before the performance actually takes place. And that's uh, um, uh, to the advantage, it's advantageous for, for everybody, both the performer and the promoter, uh, to have everything clearly set out in a contract from the start. Secondly, it can help avoid disputes arising because if everything's been set out clearly, then everyone knows where they stand and no one can say, oh, I didn't realise this or I thought that or um, those kind of uh, miscommunications that, that, that are often at the root of um, disputes and conflict. Uh, and finally, really importantly, it can protect the performer from exploitation and unfair treatment. And that's something we're very keen on here at the ISM. So what are some of the key provisions of the contract? Well, some of this is pretty obvious. It sets out clearly the fees and expenses to be paid to the performer. Um, I don't need to say why that's important, but it's great if that is done clearly. Um, another important aspect is we say that if the performance is going to be recorded, uh, you must get the performer's written consent in advance. Uh, and that, that's really important in terms of controlling what we call your rights in performance. All performers have rights in their performance. That's under the um, Copyright Design and Patents Act 1988. One of those rights is the, the right to control whether or not your work is recorded. Your, uh, and therefore, um, it's absolutely right that your performance shouldn't be recorded unless you've agreed that in writing in advance. And this is becoming a real issue because obviously it's quite common nowadays uh, in gigs and concerts for half the audience to be holding up their mobile phones and tablets. Now, uh, performers take a different view on that. You may say, it's absolutely fine by me. I've got no problem at all um, if they like my music and they want to share it with all their friends or, or, or on YouTube, that's fine. That's your call, ultimately, uh, as a performer, uh, that, that's for your call to make. Uh, but what are... Um, uh, uh, contract says is uh, that shouldn't happen unless the performer has agreed that it should happen. And if you haven't agreed that you're happy for, for people to make unauthorised recordings, then the promoter has a duty to sort of um, step in at the performance and actually tell the audience that they shouldn't be making unauthorised recordings. They're there to enjoy the music, enjoy the performance. They're not there um, to, to record it. Uh, and again, the way our um, performance contract is drafted uh, allows for that to happen. Uh, the contract also states that the promoter will ensure that adequate changing room facilities are provided uh, and, and also standard concert equipment, seating, music stands, suitable lighting. Uh, that's an issue I mean, where uh, you might want to add more to that clause if your performance has particular uh, requirements in terms of facilities, then you might want to add in a clause uh, uh, saying uh, what those particular requirements are. We're very happy to advise our, our members on adapting or modifying the template contract to meet your particular uh, uh, requirements. Another important provision of the contract is the cancellation fee. Uh, performers are entitled uh, under the contract the template contract that we're, you'll find in the performer pack to 100% of your performance fee if cancellation takes place less than six weeks before the performance was due to be given, plus any expenses that you've already incurred at the point of cancellation. So that's a really good safeguard against being cancelled at the last minute. And we think uh, that that's fair. You're a professional. Um, uh, your diary is likely to be booked up well in advance uh, and therefore you don't want last minute cancellations. They can cost you a lot of money because you may have turned down very lucrative work uh, in order to keep that slot free. Uh, and um, uh, we say 50% of the fee if uh, the cancellation takes place between 6 and 12 weeks uh, before the performance takes place. We, Our view is that if it's a notice of more than 12 weeks, then that's reasonable. You should be able to um, uh, get alternative work uh, and, and therefore we don't have a cancellation fee uh, payable if um, you've been given more than 12 weeks notice. Um, 
the fourth section of uh, the uh, webinar today is about getting your performer royalties uh, from PPL. Uh, this is uh, an important aspect of being a, a performer, uh, or, uh, which is sometimes overlooked because uh, although I can't say that everyone who's a member of PL becomes a millionaire as a result, uh, you certainly may find that you're getting several hundred pounds a year if you've Formed in a number of uh, recordings. This, this could be a really useful supplement to your, your income. So it's really important that if you're, uh, as a professional performer, you know how the PPL system works and that you're sort of plugged into that system and you're getting all the money that you're entitled to. So just a quick run through how PPL works. Anyone who has performed on or who owns the rights to recorded music should become a PPL member. Uh, PPL collects royalties for the use of, of, of recorded music whenever it's played in public or broadcast on TV or radio uh, and in respect of certain digital uh, media services, although um, uh, performers, I'm afraid, don't get royalties for um, digital streaming uh, for reasons that are a bit complicated to go into. Uh, but certainly, uh, if it's being, uh, if a recording is played in public, broadcast on TV or radio, you should receive PPL royalties for that. And that applies to everyone, featured artists, non-featured artists, regardless of the type of contract, you are entitled to what's called equitable remuneration. And that's all run by PPL. It's free to join, uh, so there's no reason not to join PPL if, you're, if you meet those requirements. Um, as I said, if you're a performer on recorded music, you should join as a performer member. If you own the rights to a recording, uh, that's being broadcast or played in public, then you should join as a recording rights holder member. And there are some additional income streams that you may be entitled to if you are a, a recording rights holder member. It is possible and you should, if you are both a performer and a recording rights holder, uh, you should join PPL as both in order to ensure that you get everything you're entitled to. Um, some further thoughts about getting performer royalties from PPL. Um, you, sh you can register with PPL online. I've already said it's free. Uh, it's a very straightforward joining process online, but it will take um, probably up to about four weeks for your application to be approved. So uh, it may take some time, but once you're in the system, you're, you're in the system. Uh, you can sign up for international royalties. Again, you can do that for free. The only complication there is if you want PPL to collect international royalties on your behalf, you might have to cancel your membership of another non-UK collecting society. So you may need to think about that if you've joined a non-UK collecting society. But certainly in principle, PPL will collect international royalties for you. You should obviously make sure that you keep your bank and contact details up to date so PPL can get the money to you. Uh, something Sometimes people overlook that. Um, but also another really um, basic but absolutely crucial uh, element of this is making sure you are listed as a performer on all the recordings which are on the PPL uh, uh, database uh, in which you have uh, performed. Um, if you're not listed as a performer, but you should be, uh, you can submit a claim for your share of royalties to PPL. You just need to submit that claim online, uh, but also submit evidence that you actually performed on the track. Um, that might be a performing contract or an exchange of correspondence uh, in which it was agreed that you should take part. Um, but if you provided you can provide the necessary evidence, um, uh, PPL will add you to the performer list and you could receive up to six years worth of backdated royalties as a result of making a successful claim. It's really important to keep on top of um, the PPL database and make sure that you are uh, listed as a performer in relation to all the recordings on which you have performed. Um, uh, final slide, uh, how the ISM can help. Uh, ISM members are entitled to free legal advice from the ISM in-house team. Uh, so we can advise you on contracts you've been offered, advise you on 
using our template performer contract, modifying or adapting that contract to meet your particular needs. We also advise on um, fees, uh, fee setting. Uh, you remember Joel talked about the, the different pricing strategies that you might uh, um, uh, adopt. And finally, um, uh, business development advice. It's been a really successful innovation that we've introduced over the last year or so. Joel, who you've heard from today, he's not only a performing musician, he's also an artist manager, uh, uh, and um, uh, he provides a sort of consultancy service for our members. Every ISM member is entitled to a, an hour's telephone advice uh, from Joel free of charge, and we've had fantastic feedback about that service. Uh, you can really discuss the issues that you're facing in terms of developing your career um, and, and that's something uh, that people find very useful. So um, if you're an ISM member, you should know how to join, how to contact us, but we've got the email and, and the contact numbers there. If you haven't joined the ISM, uh, then please consider doing so. But important to bear in mind, the performer pack that we've been talking about is available to everybody, ISM members and non-ISM members. You just have to go to the ISM website. Now, we said we'd leave some time for questions, um, but uh, and I'm glad to say we've got 10 minutes to um, uh, deal with questions. Uh, and we have got a question, which I will now read out from... Well, I'm going to read the short question first. Um, someone has asked, what does PPL stand for? It's Phonographic Performance Limited. I'm pretty sure. Everybody calls it PPL, um, but uh, uh, and if you do a Google search on PPL, you'll, you'll find the, the PPL website. Um, uh, but um, uh, as I say, all the information about PPL that I've provided is also included in, in the performer pack, so you can find the information very easily there. So that's what PPL stands for. We've also got a question about copyright. Can copyright in a piece of music be transferred to a fee payer where no specific transfer of copyright has been consented to? In the absence of a contract specifically outlining copyright provenance, would copyright remain with the creator even though a fee has been paid for the work? Ah, well, that, that's a really quite complicated question. It's a very interesting question. Um, and I, the rule is that copyright rests with the the creator uh, uh, that is the starting point so uh, if you compose a piece of music copyright in that piece of music uh, will remain with you now the question i'm being asked is what happens if somebody pays you for that piece of music uh, i think on the understanding that copyright is going to be transferred but actually there's no piece of paper, there's no written contract uh, stating that that's what's going to happen. Um, that creates quite a difficult situation because what the law says is that um, any assignment of copyright has to be in writing uh, and that's a provision in the Copyright Design and Publications Act 1988. So the, the starting point is that there has to be a written assignment. And if there is no written assignment, uh, then the presumption would be the contract remains with the original creator, uh, which would be the composer in the case of a piece of music. However, there is this uh, uh, concept in um, uh, uh, copyright law of what we call an equitable assignment. Whereas in the scenario that's being outlined, if money has been paid and it's absolutely clear that the understanding of both parties was that in exchange for the money being paid to the composer, the composer would assign copyright to the, um, uh, uh, to the person who paid the money, then the courts might say, well, even though there's no written contract saying uh, that uh, copyright has to be assigned because we are convinced that this money was paid uh, and that it was clear to everyone on what basis that money should be paid. The courts can decide, well, um, it, it would be inequitable to deny that a transfer of the copyright had taken place. So they could actually require the 
intention of the parties, which was that in exchange for the money there should be an assignment of copyright, uh, they, they might require uh, for, for that intention to be carried out and, and basically um, uh, um, um, give an injunction requiring the piece of paper, the written assignment, uh, to be um, uh, executed in order to make that uh, uh, assignment take place. So I hope that makes sense in terms of sorry, what was rather rather a complicated question. Um, but um, uh, if um, uh, if people want to ask me in more detail about specific issues, uh, then uh, uh, they, they can uh, um, contact me afterwards with the contact details I've given. Another question has come in. Hi, David and Joel. I videoed a recent concert that I performed in with the goal of adding this to YouTube to help with my publicity. Will I cause any copyright issues in doing this? Um, two questions there arise. First of all, um, uh, was the music that you were performing in copyright? Uh, which means, uh, was it composed by someone who, essentially someone who uh, died after 1946? Because copyright lasts 70 years after the composer dies. If the answer is yes, that you were performing music that was in copyright, uh, then you do need to um, uh, obtain the correct license from PRS in order to um, uh, make a recording of that and put it up on your uh, uh, YouTube channel. Um, uh, uh, PRS has lots of different sort of licenses that, that, that they tailor to the various different types of license that people require. Uh, but you do need to, to get that license from PRS. But the second question is, did the performers who uh, were performing at that concert did they consent to that recording being made and consent to it being used? Uh, and um, obviously that issue isn't going to arise if you were, if it's a solo concert and you were the only performer involved, clearly you're going to give yourself consent to, to, to use that recording. So there is no issue. But if there were other performers involved, uh, then you should not be using that recording uh, unless you have got their uh, consent to do so. Obviously, hopefully you're all friends uh, and it should be fairly straightforward for you to get that consent. But, but I think it is really important to understand that all performers have rights in the performances that, that they, they do. Uh, and, and that's um, something we're very keen to stress at the ISM because we want our members to be aware of their rights and, and know about what is the appropriate and not appropriate way to, to explore, exploit those rights. So I hope that answers your question. Um, we're getting quite close to two o'clock. We have got about four minutes. Um, so if you just time for any last questions to come in. Joel, um, I've been talking for a while. Is there anything burning that you'd like to add to anything that I've said? Um, um, I don't think so. I, I, going back a while ago, um, you mentioned about um, the list of things for the contract, which are quite useful for um, performers and people who engage performers to, to do the work. But thinking, I was, it just got me thinking from an agency perspective. Um, what we try and do when any of our artists are engaged to do work is we have a Google form um, which we have pre-populated with all of the kind of silly little intricacies that could go wrong at a concert and just make sure we have that information from the promoter uh, very early on. So are you going to be fed? What are the dietary requirements? Do you need picking up from the station? Things that don't necessarily need to be on a contract, but it's quite useful information for both the promoter and the artist to have. So like I said, we set up a Google form, which is entirely free to do. Once we've been booked um, for our artists to do any concerts, then we make sure that that Google form is sent out to the festival or the promoter. Uh, get them to fill that in. So all of those little nitty gritty things on the day that will help it go smoothly are uh, to hand. Like I said, not too important for the contract itself, but um, often leads to um, lots of good things on the day rather than people waiting at train stations for a lift that's not coming. 
Mm. I think that's really great advice, Joel, that the earlier you can think through all the details and all the nitty gritty, um, I, I agree with you, some, some of that is probably not appropriate to include in a formal contract. Um, but the earlier you get that sorted out, the earlier you say that this is everything I need you know, to make this contract, work, make this concert, uh, this performance work, go smoothly, the earlier you have that conversation with the promoter, the better. So no, I think that, that's fantastic uh, uh, advice, Joel. Thanks very much for, for, for that point. I think it's now two minutes to two. Um, I think probably I should sign off at that point. Thank you very much for listening to us for this hour. Thank you for your questions. That was really helpful. Um, uh, final point is to say there's more information in the performer pack. I hope you find it useful and, and, and use it. Do um, have a look at it. Uh, give us um, um, uh, um, uh, give us any feedback about the performer pack that you may have. We be delighted to hear from you uh, and thanks very much for your time today. Goodbye.